John Buchan was one of Scotland's most successful writers. In his 64 years, he produced over 100 novels, biographies, histories and essays, at least 54 short stories, nearly 100 poems, many in the language of lowland Scotland, some 25 published speeches and pamphlets, which can still be collected and read today, and of course many others unpublished, and innumerable articles for newspapers and journals. Although his pen never stopped, he was also a colonial administrator in South Africa, a barrister, a publisher, a war correspondent, a director of government information during the First World War, a member of Parliament, and his final years were spent as Governor General of Canada. For the next six few minutes, we'll tell you a little about this remarkable man and how this museum of his story came about. Like so many distinguished Scots, John Buchan was a son of the manse. His father, the Reverend John Buchan, was a minister in the Free Church of Scotland. His mother, Helen Masterton, was a member of a family of successful sheep farmers in Upper Tweeddale, a little west of Peebles in the Scottish borders. Our John was the eldest of six children, four boys and two girls, Anna, William, Walter, Violet and Alastair. John Buchan was born in 1875 in the Manse at 20 York Place in Perth, where his father was preaching at the Knox Church. The following year, the family moved to Parthhead in Fife, where the young John wrote a New Year hymn for his father's church at the age of 11. The Buchans had a strong connection with Peebles, the county town of Peeblesshire. The Reverend John Buchan's father, also John Buchan, moved there in 1835 to pursue a career as a country solicitor. In addition, he became the manager of the commercial bank housed in Bank House, which still stands at the west end of High Street, but looks rather different today. Eventually, his grandson, John's brother, Walter Buchan, became not only the bank manager, but was also the procurator fiscal and the town clerk of Peebles for nearly 50 years, until 1954. John's sister, Anna, was also a successful writer using the nom de plume of O. Douglas. The Buchans moved from Fife to the Gorbals of Glasgow in 1888, when the Reverend Buchan was called to the John Knox Church there. The Gorbals was to provide the characters of the Gorbals diehards, the Boy Scouts in Hunting Tower, and Glasgow was to produce such memorable figures as Dixon McCunn, the retired grocer in Hunting Tower, and Geordie Hamilton, the staunch Royal Scots Fusilier of Mr. Stanfast. John was educated at Hutchison's Grammar School on the south side of the River Clyde, and then spent three years at Glasgow University on the other side of the river. There, he fell under the benign influence of Gilbert Murray, the renowned professor of Greek, who fired Buchan with the desire to become a scholar. By this time, John Buchan was already spending much of his time writing. He published an anthology of writing about fishing in 1894, and his first novel, Sir Quixote to the Moors, in 1895. From Glasgow, Buchan moved to Brasenose College, Oxford in 1895 to continue his studies and spent four happy years among a group of friends from a much wider social circle than he had known in Scotland. Among them was Tommy Nelson, the heir to the publishing firm with whom he was to work closely in the future. He continued to write voraciously, turning out his first collection of short stories, Scholar Gypsies, in 1896, which gathered together tales which he had been writing over the previous two or three years. He won prizes with his essay on Sir Walter Raleigh in 1897 and his long poem The Pilgrim Fathers the following year when he also published his second novel, John Burnett of Barnes, which sets off from the western borders. His third novel, a tale of Jacobite intrigue, some of which swirls around Broughton, a lost lady of old years, followed in 1899. Buchan left Oxford armed with a first-class degree in greats and settled down as a lawyer and a journalist, writing for The Economist and The Spectator. But in 1901 he was called to the colonial office where the charismatic Lord Milner, the High Commissioner for South Africa, offered him a job on his staff. The task was to establish a civil service in the former Boer republics, and Buchan was given responsibility for transforming the squalid conditions in the refugee camps settling the Boers back on the land and encouraging British settlement. 
This experience in South Africa gave Buchan material for more books and stories, the most memorable of which was Prester John, about a rising of Africans to expel the white colonists, which ironically presaged just such a real event in Nyasaland five years later. After two years, he returned to London and took up the law again, but he hankered after a political career at home. In the end, he left the law and began to work with the publishing house of Nelson's, run by his great friend from Oxford days, Tommy Nelson. And then, in 1905, he met Miss Susan Grosvenor, who, although not wealthy, came from an aristocratic background. After a courtship of two years, they married and settled down in London to a blessedly happy life together. The Buchans had four children, a girl and a boy, born before the First World War, and two boys during it. John adored his growing family and always tried to be at home each evening from his work with Nelsons to share their growing up. When the First World War broke out in August 1914, Buchan was immensely frustrated that he was too old and not nearly well enough to go into uniform and see active service. While he was recovering from another bout of stomach trouble, which was eventually diagnosed as a duodenal ulcer, he wrote the book which was to make his name, The 39 Steps, the precursor of today's modern spy thriller novels. It was published in October 1915 and has never been out of print since. Buchan called the book a shocker, written for his own amusement, but in spite of that, it has spawned several films, television dramas and stage plays since it was published. Buchan continued to write, although more of his output turned to books about the war, including his monumental history of the war in 24 volumes, written as the conflict went along. Although he couldn't go into action as a soldier, he was a war correspondent for the Times and director of the government's information department. After the war was over, Buchan started to look for a house outside London. His university days had clearly laid a spell on him, and he bought the manor house in the village of Ellsfield, on the edge of Oxford. John would travel into London every day, and be back in the evenings to enjoy his young family growing up. And he wrote. The work flowed from his pen, ranging from the whimsical tale of overcoming boredom with adventure, John McNabb, to his highly regarded biography of Sir Walter Scott, and the novel Witchwood, which was his own favourite, set in the dark time of 17th century Scotland, when the church ruled the country and hypocrisy stalked the land. Buchan had always seen politics as his goal, but he was too fair-minded to have a strong party outlook. He thought liberals too self-righteous and described himself as a conservative with a move-on. Being a Tory in Scotland then, was seen as being radical when liberalism was the ruling creed. He was chosen as the Conservative candidate for Peebles and Selkirk in 1911 and actively nursed the constituency. Having been caught burning the water as a teenager, he would have had the poaching vote to a man. But it all came to naught with the outbreak of the First World War. He declined to stand in the election which followed the war, and again in 1922, but when he was offered the Scottish University seat in 1927, he accepted and was returned with a massive majority. He always took a robustly independent line, but he wasn't an orator. He didn't speak often, but his speeches were always well received and members crowded into the House of Commons to hear him. He yearned for ministerial office, but it didn't come his way, because Stanley Baldwin had other plans for him, although other honours and appointments did. In 1933 and 34, Buchan was made Lord High Commissioner of the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland, the Church's Parliament, which meets each May to debate its policy. The Lord High Commissioner represents the Crown at the General Assembly and lives in the Palace of Holyrood House for its duration. There could hardly have been a more suitable appointment as a son of the manse and a church elder, who was also the first Lord High Commissioner to visit the Free Church Assembly going on at the same time next door. Buchan's tenure was judged a great success and he was rewarded with a second term in 1934. And then, in the spring of 1935, he was asked to be the Governor-General of Canada. It was a popular choice in Canada, but there was one dilemma. The Canadians wanted a commoner and King George insisted on being represented by a peer. J.B. could not be Lord Buchan because there was one already, 
and not Lord Greenmantle, because one of the heralds was already Greenmantle Percivant. So he took the name of the village of Tweedsmuir, in the area which he had explored and been so happy as a boy, and he added Ellsfield to the title. Once they had arrived, he and Lady Tweedsmuir set up home in Government House, Rideau Hall, and were not long in winning the affection of the diverse, self-conscious, and politically restless Canadian people. Lord Tweedsmuir was keen to get to know what Canadians thought and held many informal gatherings alongside the formal duties of the King's representative. He and Lady Tweedsmuir began a series of visits to every part of the country, eschewing the formal uniforms and protocols normally associated with the Governor-General, and appearing as a countryman with a real interest in even the most remote areas and the people in this vast country. He was even made an Indian chief, and the headdress he received is still on display in the Russell Coates Museum in Bournemouth. Although he travelled energetically, Buchan still found time to write and produced some of his most thoughtful and perceptive work in this period. In 1939, Lord Tweedsmuir had to sign Canada's Declaration of War, a conflict which he hated, and although he was pressed to accept a further term as Governor-General, he decided not to carry on. His reason was that he was increasingly ill with a renewal of his old trouble with a duodenal ulcer. He felt that he had to deal with the trouble, or drag a wing, as he put it, for the rest of his life. And then, on the 6th of February, 1940, he had a cerebral thrombosis while he was shaving and hit his head. Emergency operations were carried out, but five days later, John Buchan, Lord Tweedsmuir, died at the age of 64. He was given a state funeral in Canada, and his ashes were returned to Britain aboard HMS Orion. At home, they were interred in the small churchyard at Ellsfield. He was widely and deeply mourned across Canada as a friend. John Buchan was a master storyteller, and although he would have preferred to be remembered for his more serious biographies, it was his shockers, as he called his adventure stories, such as The Thirty-Nine Steps, which were to prove the most lasting. In particular, The Thirty-Nine Steps continued to inspire films, television drama, and even stage plays at home and abroad. Still the best regarded is Alfred Hitchcock's 1935 version of the spy thriller, which starred Robert Donut and Madeleine Carroll. More films were to follow, and the stage version is still running.